All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience for this, uh, you know, our brief moment of starting a few minutes behind. Uh, my name is Morgan, and I'm an event manager at Politics and Pearls, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Soon, I will drop a link in the chat for where you can order a copy of Black Girls Must Be Magic straight from PNP's website. You can ask our speakers a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can towards the end of the program, but we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your question. Also, there are auto captions available for this event by hitting the live caption button at the bottom of your screen. Let's introduce tonight's guest. Jane Allen is the pen name for Jeanique Seeley, a graduate of Duke University and Harvard Law School. An avid traveler, she speaks three languages and has visited five continents. Drawing from her unique experiences as an attorney and entrepreneur, she crafts transcultural stories that touch upon contemporary women's issues such as workplace and career dynamics, race, fertility, modern relationships, and mental health awareness. Allen will be in conversation with Nancy Johnson, an Emmy-nominated award-winning television journalist at CBS and ABC affiliates in the market, uh, markets nationwide. Her debut novel, The Kindest Lie, has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Entertainment Weekly. It's been named one of the most anticipated books of 2021 by Newsweek, Oh, The Oprah Magazine, Shondaland, NBC News, Marie Claire, Elle, The Chicago Tribune, The New York Post, Good Housekeeping, Parade, Refinery29, and more. Nancy's work has been published in Real Simple and Oh, The Oprah Magazine. Let's give our guests a virtual round of applause. Hello, everybody. Welcome, <laughs> welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you. Shane, it's so good to see you. I'm so excited to be here with you. I started applauding after I heard your intro, oh, your bio. I was, <laughs> I was a little I'm embarrassed. For you. It, was, it was a little long. I was like, okay, I should have probably shortened no, that a little it's, bit. It's great. <laughs> and there's, there's even more. Your um, high profile book club pick and all kinds of things. So I congratulations. Know, I'm, oh, thank I'm you. Excited. Yeah, I have that to sh share with you too, because your book, uh, Black Girls Must Die, um exhausted was a target book club pick right yes yes yes, yes. and uh now my book the kindest lie has been a target book club pick it's so exciting yes well it definitely i think people you know you it's not the first place you think of people picking up books which is nice that it's expanding the market for readers and especially putting books by african-american authors in front of people where they are and not necessarily you know shopping for books but maybe they'll pick a book up and then they'll go pick up another book and I know they're buying their, buy their paperback buy something else yeah right, exactly. buy paperback and then get a paper have paper paper towels and then get a paperback <laughs> exactly right I mean, that's one of my my favorite things to hear from a reader is that you know they've broken out of their their reading slump or they haven't read a or finished a book in so long and they picked my book up and that's gotten them back into reading so that's one of my the best things I can hear yeah. So I'm um, excited for all of these things, all these developments. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm excited for you. And we are here to talk about the second book in your trilogy, Black Girls Must Be Magic. I love the first one. Excited about this one. Looking forward to the third book in the trilogy that I think is dropping soon. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what life has been like for you. Probably a trilogy. Like I can't even imagine. I'm like, trying to get one book out is a huge undertaking. <laughs> so tell me about the trilogy and then also kind of where you started as a self-published author. And that had to take so much grit and patience and perseverance to get here. Well, it, I'm learning day by day what it's like. And this has been a really interesting experience for me. And I started out in the music industry and I watched artists build their uh, their platforms and their careers. And I, it, it, I've watched it and I've participated and I've been in the background helping, but it never, I've never been in the foreground actually doing it and understanding what it feels like and understanding that a career and an audience and a platform is literally built 
day by day, person by person, event by event, conversation by conversation, and really understanding what it means to build a relationship with, with people and readers. And also the degree of trust that people have to have with you and build with you and for your work. So that's as a writer and as an author, it's a different level. You know, for music, it's like you hear a song and, you know, you may encounter that song in the car or, you know, it's a very low investment kind of thing. And then you're jamming to it and, you know, you, you know, you want to hear it again. And that's, you know, you can hear it for free and it's, it's not a, a really high value time investment to make. But when it comes to a book, what I realized in thinking about it is that people are with you for the amount of time that you would binge a television series, you know, a whole season of something. And so that's really an investment. And, and then also depending on if you're dealing with challenging material, if it's not just a, you know, if it's an entertaining read, but still there's, there's heavier material, there's a whole process that people go through of, of having to get to know you, of, of having to understand and be willing and ready to make that investment. So I really under, I really take it seriously and I really have come to um, appreciate the degree of investment that readers are making with us and, and what that relationship is like and, and why people go back to the same authors over and over because it wasn't something that, it wasn't a decision made lightly, I realized. So, that's been part of it. Uh, I originally self-published uh, the Black Girls trilogy, and some people know that story. Uh, and that, so this has really been a miracle for me. The fact people will tag me when they see the book in the airport, I'm just, you know, and, and be like, oh, I'm at, you know, I'm in Phoenix or I'm in JFK. I saw the book. I was, I think I was in maybe three cities and saw the book in each of those cities you know, at the airport. And that was incredible. Uh, and different stores and different cities. And just the fact that it's ubiquitously available, that was in and of itself. I, I think people don't realize the holding the book in your hand because you were able to easily access it and buy it physically somewhere, including in your local bookstore, is a miracle in and of itself. And that process of starting from a self-published place what I had the, the uh, idea for the book and this protagonist, this black female protagonist, that's always kind of a, a precarious place to be when it comes to traditional publishing space because with gatekeepers, they're gonna kind of operate from a historical perspective and maybe even a bi biased perspective of what the audience will be. And when I presented my book for the people that I presented it to, which was a universe of, it wasn't that wide, it wasn't every agent, but it was, you know, enough. The view was that, oh, the, you know, we don't like this protagonist. We don't find this story relatable. We don't find her perspective relatable. And, um, and thankfully, the readers that I had, you know, gotten first opinions from had told me something different. So that gave me the courage to move forward in spite of that. And that's why I originally decided to self-publish because I think a lot of times getting that kind of, it was not nice feedback. <laughs> and I think a lot of times getting that kind of feedback might make you want to you know, shove your manuscript in a drawer. And I just didn't want that to be the story. And I thought, well, you know, worst case scenario, if readers hate it, then at least I put it out to readers and I'll learn something and, you know, we'll, I'll have another shot. Maybe they'll, you know, read something else that I write. And so having put it, it out independently gave me this opportunity to really, on a, again, that person to person, reading group by reading group, city by city. Uh, one of my, my very first uh, stops as a writer was in Washington, DC with the self-published edition, but being able to connect with people, get their feedback and just be able to see what, that, what the book and what the story meant to people gave me the kind of energy in my tank to keep going. And so during the 2020 period, and this was pre-George Floyd and post-George Floyd, I wound up sitting with the, uh, over 60 book clubs. I just, any book club, and I try to do this even now, if it's, you know, even any book club, if they want me to come and want to help, want me to help unpack their experience of the book, I will try to at least join, even if it's for just a bit. Uh, because I appreciate them reading and, you know, maybe their questions or I, I want this book to be an experience that comes off of the pages. And so I wound up uh, meeting through one of those book clubs, a person that introduced me to my agent. 
and she brought the book and the series to Harper Collins. And it's very unusual for a self-published book to be uh, picked up by a traditional publisher because they don't, all of them don't know what to do with, you know, a property and that, that's had some exposure, but really needs amplification. And, uh, and Harper Perennial, they were, have been an incredible team and they have been very invested and they said, let's do this, let's build this, let's make sure it's everywhere and that anybody who wants to read it can hold it in their hands. So it's really been a miracle <laughs> that we're oh, at this point. And I think it was a good bet, obviously. Yeah, well, because thank you. <laughs> this book is connecting with so many people Black women, you know, like me in particular, but also just so many women, I think, period, people, you know, I think it, there's a universality oh, yeah. to it. And you're following the story of Tabitha. And I think Tabitha is just a fabulous uh, character. And I've really enjoyed Thank following you. her journey. And I can't wait to see what you're kind of her. a real life Tabitha. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, right? And so <laughs> in this book, Tabitha is embracing this period of entering single motherhood mm -hmm. and um i just want to know you know she's doing it by choice mm -hmm. um and why did you decide to write that particular storyline uh for her and looking at you know sperm donor and this you know different way to become a mother so i my personal journey i'm in my early 40s and when I started writing this book i the, the idea came to me when I was in my very late 30s and the experience that i had had been taking up kind of years of my life. Should I do it? Should I not? How, how much is it going to cost? Is this worth the investment? Doing all this research was freezing my eggs and trying to figure out how I was going to manage my fertility options. And what I learned in that process was that really it's something that is most effective when you're, or, or the, an easier process when you're in your early years, your late twenties, early thirties, but if you don't have access to information, it's and it's not something that people readily talk about, you're kind of at a loss. And so you lose this window, This the best window of opportunity, ironically, is the one that you lose for all these reasons. And we just do not talk about reproductive health. And especially as from the perspective and as it pertains to black women, because there are certain issues that affect black women disproportionately, but it's, it's things that all women should be talking about. And quite frankly, everybody should be talking about in support of you know women and people that are going through these issues so uh, i realized it was a war of information and time yeah and so i wrote the book in the sense that i wish somebody had handed to me in my late 20s and early 30s and that would have at least something that would give me awareness of this aspect of life that would give me more options, you know, and, and it's been really encouraging for me to be in reading groups and groups of women and book clubs, and they're talking about reproductive health now. And people are saying, you know, I've never had, I've never talked about this with my friends, but, you know, I've been dealing with fibroids, I've been dealing with endometriosis. And then, you know, they start talking about these things and, and people are no longer isolated. And if, you know, if that's something that can come about uh, through reading where, you know, people are now have access to bring these issues into community that was one of my my goals for this. But um, with Tabitha in particular, I just thought it was something we don't see in fiction. When I went uh, in, to my journey, I, there were there was, I think, virtually nothing in fiction and very little in nonfiction about this. So yeah. I thought, okay, this is something that is kind of unseen that we should explore. Yeah, this really resonated with me personally, too, because when I was 40, turned 40, um, I went to my gynecologist and the gynecologist, you know, said to me, you need to make some decisions right now about what you want to do. And I'm like, uh, I don't know what you mean. And I said, I'm not married, you know, and um, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't have any children. And the doctor said, you need to decide, are you more concerned with your social situation or becoming a mother? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't prepared for that conversation. And a huge well, thing to put in front of somebody. I was just like, oh my God, I'm sitting here, you yeah. know, and you're saying this to me. And I re remember feeling like, I don't know what to do. And so I didn't do anything. And yeah. that of itself was a choice. And so I don't have any children, you know? So I chose not to do anything, you know, when I heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really could have used a book like this, you know, to see that something like this, you know, is possible. Um, and I think there's always been that stigma too um, about single mothers. Right. And that is about race too, you know? And so it's not even 
now, now I hear more women making this choice, but that yeah. was not always the case. Well, I think even the terminology and one of the characters in the book for in, in Black Girls Must Be Magic kind of alludes to this, that single motherhood by choice implies that single motherhood in and of itself is some other thing, you know, mm. so there is, there is not by choice, there's, which, you know, allows for a stigma to be attached to it. And I think Black women have unfairly borne the burden of the negative stigma stigma of single motherhood. Uh, and, you know, in the 80s, there was this whole rhetoric of the, and, and imagery that was created, this invention of the sort of the welfare queen and all of this that was associated with uh, single motherhood and, and the concept of, bl of Black mothers as single mothers, when in reality, there's a lot of economic responsibility and, uh, and forward mobility that's happened, economic mobility that's happened uh, with Black women in that space and uh and there's just an increase of options for women that we should be able to have outside of the stigma so some of the things that i wanted to do with this series is reclaim <laughs> the celebration of our personhood you know as black women just go back and reclaim all of the things that have been uh associated with societal stigma you know whether it's our hair or, or you know our our vernacular or um our emotional expression or our decisions about family and or, or singlehood or not being single just all of it i just wanted to go back and bit by bit by bit reclaim it and turn it into a celebration and 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 just something that we can own and and stand with and and be proud of and yeah. you know you achieved that right. for sure. And, <laughs> and you mentioned, you mentioned hair. So I want to talk about hair, which is a yeah. big um, part of this particular uh, yes. book in the, in the trilogy, hair. And the other connection was with the, the occupation. So Tabitha is a television news anchor and I used to do television news. So there's so much about that. that I'm like, oh my God, I can relate so well. And then she's dealing with these issues of hair and having to go into her news director and have these conversations. I remember from being in news that everything is about ratings. Yes. And that's what drives it all. And so you've got all these people sitting out there at home, you know, and they're boxers, they don't know you, but they're making judgments about you and how you look and how you present. And so she has this conversation about her news with her news director about her hair and the fact that she's wearing a natural hairstyle. And it's a very awkward uncomfortable conversation to have and it's that moment where she has to decide is this the hill I want to die on or not <laughs> talk to me about that whole scenario and, and, and that subplot and what that was about well so in other books that I've read you know there where there is representation there's black characters and they'll be described by external characteristics, for example, oh, someone has crinkly hair and you know and, and this you know brown skin crinkly hair maybe a spunky attitude but from my vantage point, living in this body and in this skin and, and with the societal experience of this, if you have crinkly hair at your workplace and you're at a largely you know, white workplace or there's, it's not you know, somewhere where there's a lot of people like you and you're wearing your natural hair texture, that journey, that decision does not come easily to someone typically. If that's what you've decided to do, you're going counter societally, counter culturally, and you're stepping out and doing something that we've been conditioned to believe is unprofessional. You know, you're jeopardizing your career and your position and your mo your upward mobility in your workplace. So why? So that decision process, that like finding the courage to do that or whatever was the impetus to do that, that's interesting. You know, that's and that's a universal concept. That's about authenticity, maybe. That's about courage. That's about you know, personal fulfillment, it's so many things. And yes, it's from the, it's a unique vantage point of this particular experience from, uh, that a black woman, a journey that a black woman could, would take. But so many people could relate to that if you really drill down into experience and don't just look at it from appearances and, and follow the internal journey. So I thought, wow, that's sort of a hero's journey in its yeah. own respect, even though it's this sort of really seems like a small discrete moment that moment you show up at work with your natural hair and, but it's a huge deal and then what comes along with it and what do you have to deal with and what 
internal battles are you fighting? And if you really break it down, it's quite a story. So that was what I wanted to show that, you know, in, in this body and in this experience, even sometimes just basic day-to-day -day decisions that to the outward perspective, if you're not familiar, look like, oh, she changed her hair. No, you know, she, she had to stand in the mirror and fight against everything society said that to her about what her natural hair meant and what it would mean for her and everything that she's fought for in her career and put it on the line and say, I don't want to wear this costume anymore. I yeah. want to, I want to be me today. And, um, and then how do you, and then from that moment, you got to still fight a battle, you know, and, and Tabitha in particular, because of her position right. and what you were saying about ratings, it becomes amplified and it becomes oh. this whole other journey. Yeah, this is your livelihood too. Yeah. You know, that's at stake, you know, in terms of her, so making many ways. Stand, you know, in many ways. Yeah. In many ways, it's about her life, especially when she's trying to uh, be a, a single parent. Yes. You know, so then yeah, you don't have another income. You got to rely on this. And, you know, am I going to jeopardize what I have? Right. You know? And, um, and then I love the details about hair, you know, with the, the getting the sew in of the wig and then, and then just the moment that I can relate to it, you know, when you take the wig off and you, you've got the cornrows, the braids, and you can feel that air that hits your scalp and it's like, oh my God. And so it's this oh, feeling of freedom in your hair and your head, but also there's that other freedom too, I felt, yeah. you know, yeah. it was you internal know. and external. Yeah. And, and for, uh, some people don't know this either. I, I put this on my Instagram, but when I was writing this and even in the first edition of this, of the book, I had never worn my natural hair texture. I didn't even know what it was like. Yeah. I had, you know, had a relaxers and then I uh, had, you know, different hairstyles. I wore wigs, weave, sew-ins, extensions, all kinds of things, but always straight and always, and just, I didn't, it just wasn't in my, you know, thought of this is what was, was authentic to me. You know, I, I saw myself as <laughs> this, I don't know, whatever. So, but I, but in this process and, and writing this for Tabitha and, and stepping into her shoes and writing from her perspective and going through this with her as a writer and as reading it, it gave me that question, you know, well, can I do this? And what does it mean for me? And at least I should know what my hair texture is like. And that, that was the first moment where I wore my natural hair texture and then subsequently wore my natural hair to work and i had that experience personally after i had written that experience for for tabitha were and, you worried at all about going out oh my um, God, talking yeah. about a book where you have really highlighted natural hair and then not wearing natural hair say in interviews and that kind of thing was that a, a factor I, it, it wasn't at first, but then it started to become that because I, the more I was connecting with readers and the more I was connecting with the story and the more I was living into the space of, you know, in the promotion of the book, talking about the book, expanding the experience of the book, it just started, it started to become something I internalized. I hadn't even thought about it. I was like, I'm, here's my book and here's me. And I, you know, and, and here's the story. And I just believe in this character, but it's, it's her, it's not me, you know, it's, it's not me, it's fiction. And so it wasn't, you know, I didn't internalize it, but it became fiction that you, you can learn from, you know, that, that yeah. can do something in, you know, that be, can become meaningful in real life. And it, was that for me? And I guess that's what I was hoping for, but, <laughs> but I didn't feel like. Well, your fiction, your art was transformative. It's not just for the readers, but also for you as the writer too, as the author. It I was, think it was. Powerful that that happened. Um, I want to talk about a big theme in the book or part of the book, which is Tabitha's relationship with Mark. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of, um, complexity about that you know I think relationship you know for so many of us who kind of who may want marriage and children and you want it in a certain order and I think Tabitha is one of those people who plans it out and she's yeah. you know had a checklist which so many of us as women no matter who we are we have had you know probably that checklist and Mark really he checks the boxes you know what I mean he's good looking he's got this great job you know he's you know got the great education, he's, you know, the pedigree, everything checks out, but yet I feel like there's this 
push and pull that Tabitha is wrestling with what she really wants to do. And is it about yearning for him and wanting what's wanting him or wanting the best for herself? And right. that's where I see the struggle. And I thought you've really handled that beautifully. Can you talk about that? Yeah, thank you for that. The well, the one of the things that when in writing this book, I I was asking myself what about my experience with being a black woman? You know, what does that mean? Because I don't wake up in the morning and I'm sure you don't either thinking I'm black, I'm a black woman. You know, like there's there's not like an announcement with my alarm, like, wake up, <laughs> black woman, you know, you're, you know, it's, it's not that, um, it's, it, and so I had to really think what, what are the characters, what, are, at least from my vantage point, what are characteristics of this experience, and one of those characteristics is sort of this checklist, and I think that it evolved, you know, we're very, we're conservative, we're by the rules, we're like, well, what are the rules, I'm going to follow the rules, I'm going to get the rules done, and I think it's partially survival mechanism because we've been a very traumatized people. So we're like, okay, give me the list of the things that I need to do to survive in this world. Right. And I will do them better than anyone else so that I can, you know, ensure my survival and the survival of my offspring, really. You know, so we're so yeah, as we become successful professionally, whatever, we have this checklist. We're going to be this professional, we're going to do this, we're going to get an education, we're going to do all this stuff. And that should mean that we get the promised land yeah know? the husband is kind of the prize at the end right well, after all that work, you know it's supposed to be yeah. right it's yeah. supposed to be mm -hmm. and so tabby is is that is is doing that and she's realizing it's not fulfilling for her and then when it comes down to a really human issue you know i'm she's got a fertility issue she's like i've got something going on we've been together for this long how, how you know make can you make a call about where we're going and he's like uh you know I, I don't yeah, know. yeah she come they now become face to face off of paper now they become face to face as human beings flawed human beings and now there are issues that were careful like very well hidden between a little bit of distance and also this like kind of paper perfect appearance now they're on the table now now she's dealing with somebody that's mark who's never really had to think about his flaws and his trauma and why he's this, you know, what has caused him to be this paper perfect person, because there's a reason behind that. Mm -hmm. And now we get to meet his family who in the first book, he, you know, talked about that, that there's a lot of trauma there for him. And he didn't know if he ever wanted anything to do <laughs> with traditional family structures because his was so, you know, broken. And mm -hmm. so here's, and then Tabitha, you know, I think he goes back and forth about who he wants to be to her because he's not prepared in his own wholeness. And the thing I like about Tabitha as a character, which I find no matter what I throw at her, there's the societal conventions and the pressure to go that way, but there's still something burning inside of her to ask one more question or to dial into her fulfillment. Like once that, that spark was ignited for Tabitha, that about the possibility of having fulfillment and maybe it's not along the lines of societal expectations. Once that spark was ignited, it's like, okay, it doesn't go out. Even if, you know, the hardships and being faced with the pressures of going in one direction or another, it's still there for her. And I find as, as a writer with that character. Mm -hmm. So that's what I really like about her. And it's allowed me to take these two imperfect people, well, all of the people are imperfect. I mean, her friends or, you know, everybody, but Mark, I in a lot of, you know, romances or, you know, books where you have this romantic interest, the guy's either perfect and he does everything the way that he's supposed to, or he's the villain, you know, and Mark right. is neither, he's complex. He's got, he's yep. trying, he's not, he's failing a little bit, but he's, but he's trying. And I wanted to see that in this story. I really wanted to see two people who would otherwise maybe give up in each other and go their separate ways, not. And maybe they don't wind up together, but they're gonna try. And I wanted oh, to see that try. Because there were so many moments where I kept thinking, okay, this is it, they're done. You know what I mean? And <laughs> yeah. then it was like, no, they're still hanging in or, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I liked that. It felt very, very real, you know? 
they made me appreciate the characters and their complexity. And you're right. I try to do the same thing where there are no heroes and there are no villains, but yeah. everybody is multidimensional and they're complex. And I think you've achieved that. And so, you know, we focus on men and the romantic uh, relationships, but I think some of the core relationships in, in this trilogy, a core relationship is female friendship. Yeah. And uh, Tabby's friends, you know, these, they're like ride or die, you know, they're her girls. Um, but yet I like the way you, you explore friendship because there can be ups and downs and your friends can, can disappoint you, you yeah. know, they can hurt you, um, you can hurt them. But yet when it's real, it's, they're always there no matter what. And um, tell us about, you know, friendship between women and what you wanted to say about how transcendent that is. I love your questions, Nancy. These are <laughs> they're so beautiful. Uh, the, well, the friendship between Tabitha and her friends, again, I, I was really, as you were saying, we, there's no heroes and no villains. I just found it more interesting to have imperfect characters that don't neatly fit any, you know, particular framework where as a reader you're also having to make your own you know calls i'm not doing any work for the reader i, I want the reader to be able to make their own decisions and you know and, and just it's just not obvious and, and there's no black and white it's just like people like well black and white figuratively but, right, <laughs> but, right. but it, just like people it's you you ha you can't write this person off yet for any particular reason and won't let anybody off the hook that easily so with the friendships i it was important for me for it to be imperfect because i think that that imperfection you can still have exactly what you need and and have it be so very imperfect because people are imperfect and these friends are are imperfect and their friendship really hasn't been tested so much because and it does it's kind of like that in your 20s and your early you know up to your early 30s maybe life isn't really really testing you yet but when you get into your 30s and like your 40s <laughs> it's like <laughs> fireballs yeah. from all you're like okay you know that's where the fireballs start and so it was important for me to show this imperfection of, of friendship in these people but yet they're still doing their best to show up for each other and failing like in the first book they failed each other in a lot of ways but then they picked up the pieces and they're still friends and it and made them stronger in some ways and in this book you know, they're still, they're still doing that. They're, and, uh, you know, Laila in particular, she's going, continuing her journey. And, uh, and what I realized in writing this, and it's really challenging from a first person perspective, because we don't have that omniscient narrator. Mm -hmm. If Tabby is not seeing it or hearing of it or, you know, whatever, it's kind of not happening. But when a person's going through something and they're having a personal challenge, whether they're depressed or they're, you know, overwhelmed, what it looks like a lot of times is being a bad friend. They're not, they're absent, you know, and in their absence, we make, we project and we make decisions, we make, you know, projections about them and think, oh, you know, they're too busy or they're whatever. And, and then sometimes self-care looks like being a bad friend where you, and, you know, there's a point where Layla is like, I can't, and, and it's not easy. I wish I could, but I can't. And she and she would have probably never done that, but for you know the things that happened in the first book. So that I wanted to just explore that and and show that. And I think especially now in these times that we're in, when we're in it's such a years long challenge, it's the same for us. Like sometimes what you're seeing, experiencing, looks one way. It looks like somebody being absent, but really they're going through something, you know. And yeah. that's what it looks like. So mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful job with handling friendship. Uh, so everybody, please put the, your questions in the Q&A box. We're going to get to those soon. So get the questions in there for Jane. Uh, I do want to talk about the title of the book, this most recent yeah. one. So Black <laughs> Girls Must Be Magic. And we hear some yeah. stuff all the time about Black Girl Magic, of course. Yeah. So what does yeah. it mean for Black Girls to be magic? I think it's a complex, complex title. This one again, you know, it's double meanings, triple mm -hmm. meanings, and there's the meaning of, you know, that black girls must be magic to be what we wind up being in spite of all of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that must be something outer worldly and, and, you know, beyond human, which 
also has its downside because the question is, well, why do we have to be so extraordinary? Right, that perfectionism just thing, to, right? Yeah. yeah. Just to just to make it through the day, like you know, what that's that's beyond an expectation of a of the average person to yeah. expect all of this in spite of the the layers of weight that um that we're asked or forced uh to carry mm -hmm. and so you know what about when you're not magic you know and and what is the cost of that magic and and then you know is that really necessary to be who you need or want to be in life so it's it's meant to ask the question and and, and beg the question of these things but it's also meant to be a celebration just like the first book you know kind of shifting meanings around and, and playing with words a little bit so it's meant to be a celebration it's meant to be an acknowledgement but it's also meant to be a call to thrive in certain ways and and to uh realize that you know in spite of a lot we are we are actually doing magic in these ways we're turning uh, this concept of alchemy, we're turning the least of or the worst of circumstances into the best of circumstances. And that's sort of this like cultural alchemy that we've learned yeah. to do. That's interesting because I didn't, you know, I hadn't thought about all the different meanings of that until you just explained it. I'm thinking magic, like, you know, we're wonderful. We, you know, we persevere, all these things that make us special, but it's also the burden that we carry too as black women yeah. and what's expected of us, you know, um, yeah. in various situations. Cause I think about Tabitha, you know, in that newsroom and everything that she's experiencing that her white counterparts in the newsroom don't have to, yeah. to even think about or deal with, you know, and she's in that, you know, there was like this special meeting, you know, that was called to discuss, uh, you know, whatever issues are going on. And she's sitting there holding a lot in, you know and not knowing, and you've got to decide Again, is this the hill I'm going to die on today? Is this the hill? You know? <laughs> exactly. Right? And um, yeah, and then she's still got to deal with that, deal with the pressure of the viewer complaints and all that and go on the air and deliver and be professional uh, every day. And so yeah. it's a lot um, yeah. To, yeah. for us to carry. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think we should celebrate ourselves for that. And, I, and that was another reason why it also bringing that idea of friendship, because I, I think a lot of times, regardless of how we're partnered, our friendships wind up being our core support. And in, even if we're not using it as that, it's something to think about that we have these other strong women around us that we have access to, and that and that we hopefully are drawing upon that as a support resource because we need support resources. We need support. Yes, yes. We need support resources. Oh my God, amen to that. Um, yeah. All right, it's time for me to see what questions have come in. Uh, Anissa Armstrong, reader extraordinaire. Um, well, first of all, uh, someone anonymous said that we're both gorgeous women. So let's oh. celebrate that. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I know, that's very, very nice. Uh, all right, so this first one um, from Anissa, did your writing process change any from writing your first book to the second book? So it did a little bit. So I, I learned with each journey and the first book, I just wrote what I, it was my first novel. I was like, I'm gonna write what I wanna write. I'm gonna just, you know, I, I wrote it for readers and I wanted to craft an experience for readers, but I really, you know, I was trying a few different things and I was a little indulgent here and different things. In the second book, I wanted to be a little bit tighter with the structure. And so I, I didn't, you know, let it, let it flow as much as I did in the first book. So it's a little bit of a different experience and I'm just learning and, and trying, you know, different things along the way. And, um, and just trying to craft really compelling experiences for readers, but also allow myself the room to grow. So I did, the second book was a, a bit like that. And um, also having to um, continue these characters journeys and, and make sure that that was continue, continuous and, and, but still pushing them forward in their evolution. With yeah, the, Was that a struggle? I was going to ask you about that too. Um, if there was time just about, you know, you've got Tabitha in three different books, you know, and usually like for me, I'm thinking about the character arc just for one book. Yeah. And we've got to carry that through and keep people engaged for three books. How challenging was that? And, and how did you 
do that? Did you outline that? I mean, how did you make that happen? Uh, I have to outline. And the way I, the way I started with, uh, um, I did not do this, I don't think in the first book, but in the second book, I had a very clear arc of where Tabby, Tabby was going, where everybody was going. I mean, literally every character, I'm like, this is where they start. This is where I need them to finish you know, personally in their personal evolution and personal growth. And we basically get three different tabbies, you know, in each mm -hmm. book. In the first book, we've got a tabby that's, you know, was starting out kind of bopping along in life, had it all buttoned up, you know, not even, maybe not even that interesting. And then tabby gets pretty interesting pretty quickly because her life falls apart. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we have tabby in book two is, uh, you know, soon to be mom, but not having to do, you know, knowing what um, that journey will not being in the thick of having an actual baby, but preparing for that and having to kind of figure out what her life should be. And so there's still this little idealized space for her where she's trying to not checklist it, but kind of, you know, still work it out in that way. And in the third book, you know, she's in the thick of it and she's got to, you know, cope and there's, you know, another opportunity for falling apart in a different way. So there's different tabbies for each book. And, and that's, you know, it, that's kind of interesting to write, thinking about what of these life developments, how that shifts her thinking and then what becomes important and, you know, what are her challenges at that point? Right, right. So what's next for you? You've got the third book is coming. Tell us a little bit about the third book. Can you tease it? So the third book, Tabby is a mom and she's got, um, she's got to figure out her family structure, you know, again, what does she want to do? And I think it's really challenging for her to um, figure out, does she want a traditional family structure or does she want to do what she originally wanted to do, which is, you know, be on, have this experience on her own and then, you know, decouple that from the idea of partnership and, you know, find something that feels fulfilling to her in her mind, but she still doesn't know what it is. I think in this, in this third book, she's really trying to figure out what love is. Yeah. And, and, she's, yeah, and, and, and I think that experience for her becomes very uh, acute in, in that journey and becoming a mom and, and all the things around it. So, and then there's the different characters in the book, you know, Lisa Sinclair is going through something at that time and she spends some time with her mom and it, it's just, see, it's, it's this unfolding of what love means and what love is and the, the pertinent sacrifices that go along. Okay, very good. All right, so more audience questions. Um, this one um, also from Anissa wanting to know um, what our experience was being um, a target book club pick for both of us. Question. You gotta answer that first, Nancy. Okay, yeah, I mean, it was just amazing and wonderful and I, it wasn't totally unexpected. Uh, these things don't happen at the last minute. You find out in advance. I think it was six months before my book came out that I found out it was a Target book club pick, but you can't tell anybody. So it's right. all top secret, confidential. I didn't tell anybody but my mother. So I did tell my mother and that was it. And then I got, you know, one day at the doorstep were seven boxes full of these, what they call tip-in sheets. Yeah. I had 7,700 to sign. Basically it's the page in there to say this is a target you know exclusive signed edition and I had to write my name and you know so it was, I think it went through more than 20 pins and it was just so exciting and then just to have the promotion from target so many friends and family people I don't know taking selfies um you know with my book at target and so it's just been an unbelievable experience um what about you that's that's similar I mean it's you know it's this you can't tell anybody but it's this big deal um, and then the signing of the pages. I mean, it, it's like, I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? I, can't, yeah. I have no idea how to sign these pages. And my, my dad was, I, I went home, I think for, for something in that window. And my dad was like, just, you just have to sit and start. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Wow. So I was like, well, break it down, you know, figure out how many pages need to sign a day. And then That's you what I did too. <laughs> yeah. So I had, I, I would turn, I would, uh, turn on the, um, classic soul playlist. And I have my Alexa playlist. I'm like, okay, you know, give you some classic soul or some, you know, 90s R&B. I don't know. I just had a, play, a music playlist and I would get to signing. So I got through those. It was so thrilling to like wrap up those pages. I was like 
wrapping them with saran wrap and yeah. serve them all back. And I just, I felt like such a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> I didn't, had no idea I could sign that many. <laughs> but, um, but that was, and then seeing the book in Target and, you know, on the screen and just having, seeing friends and family go into the store and have that experience was incredible. And just the support of the, of the Target team. And I just, you know, love that they're highlighting books in that way, but it's just, you know, it's a place where a lot of people visit for their daily supplies and maybe even, you know, again, like don't normally think about picking up a book as a form of entertainment. So it's just a nice place to be onboarding um, potentially new readers and, you know, building, helping to build more of a reading community uh, that way. So. Yep. It, it, very good. Yep. Okay. Um, so you spoke a bit about working in the entertainment industry before. How was that transition to writing full time? So the uh, music industry taught me a lot about what it takes to build uh, an audience and a base for entertainment pro uh, property. But like I was saying, it's very different with books because it's so much more of an investment that's required on the part of a reader. You know, when you pick up a book, it's just so personal, and the experience is so personal. You know, you're the your your brain, your mind is the stage that this all unfolds on. You know, so it's just such a collaboration and and so much more. Um, I don't know, personal, I guess, in that way that in how I've experienced music in, in certain respects. Uh, but um, for from working in a corporate space to writing full time, one of the things for me that was always out in the distance, I never imagined I would be an artist and to call myself an artist. I'm like, you know what? But really understanding what that means to be an artist. And as a writer, that's you are. You're taking, you're ingesting life. And then you're applying your, your understanding of the meaning of it all, of you know, and your perspective onto it, and giving it back to people, for hopefully helping to foster their, you know, enjoyment or understanding or experience of of life. So that's been really the transition of of learning to be an artist, of learning to, uh, and that's why I had a pen name to start because I really didn't have the courage to step mm -hmm. out in that way and and fully express unencumbered <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I'm building that you know that's that that's my literary Sasha fierce so I'm building <laughs> I think with Beyonce is like I don't need it anymore and I want to get to that Beyonce point where you know you don't need Sasha fierce anymore but oh, uh cool. yeah oh. so that's the training artist training wheels training you okay I'm gonna combine two questions here do you have any so this is I assume beyond the trilogy do you have any other projects or books in the works and what would your advice be for budding writers so my, the third book, the Black Girls trilogy is on the way and I'm working on a fourth book, which is a standalone, completely different universe, different people. And it's a kind of swap situation. Uh, a woman uh, from Chicago swaps lives briefly to barely with a woman from Malibu, very sheltered. The woman from Chicago is black and the woman from Malibu is white. She's an artist, very, very sheltered existence. Uh, but is kind of down on her luck. And the woman from Chicago is um, hiding uh, ended engagement from her family. Oh. And so, <laughs> so she's escaped. They're both escaping in different ways. And then in their, in living in each other's respective shoes, they find some keys to life that they never knew they were missing. And so um, it involves a black girl surfing, which I'm really excited about. And so in research, I had to buy a wetsuit because I've got to get uh, in the water and figure that out. Oh, this is going to be fun for you. Oh, yes. Go on yes. tour with this one. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be so, some surfing involved. Black girl, yeah, surfing involved. <laughs> so that's really, it's fun to think about and, and fun to explore and, and research. And for budding writers, I would just say to get to the end of your first draft by any means necessary. And do not do not edit while you're writing, just get to the end of your first draft. Do whatever you have to do to get to the end of your first draft. Because once you have that, to me, that's like, if you're a potter, having that first draft is like having the clay that you need to make whatever you're gonna make, whatever beautiful work you're gonna make. And so having that kind of ugly first draft is the clay that you'll work from to craft excellence in the future but just get to the end of it so that you have something to work with. Something to work with, yep. And then back to your trilogy, do the books stand on their own or do people have to have read one, you know, them in sequence, sequential order or anything? 
they they can stand on their own. I mean, but you, you I I think that their the experience is augmented by reading the other ones because um, it's they're not dependent on one another, but I think yes. they inform each other. Inform each other, yeah. Thanks, Linda, for that question. Uh, mm -hmm. Marissa Peters, uh, oh no, Michelle, for instance, Michelle from Canada. Uh, would you consider bringing your stories to the big screen if you were approached by a, by a big producer? And if so, how would you stay true to your craft? I've been having quite a few of those conversations. And uh, so, yes, um, absolutely. I think that would be fantastic. I think that readers have been calling for that. And I would love to see this story transformed in a different medium and um, a different incarnation of it. It's how I view it. It's, it's informed by, but it's a different incarnation of it. Sort of, you know, even the audiobook to me is a different form of the work. So what I, I think the thing that I hold in the, in the back of, or forefront of my mind in those conversations, and I say this in every meeting that I have, is that it's really important that the excellence uh, is, is there and that we're doing justice to what the readers expect. And I just want that standard to always be what's reflective of the story. And, um, and you know, that's the, the main thing. And, and to me personally, not to get in the way. So to bring the people on board that are as passionate about telling the story, that are passionate about the story itself to begin with, and that will bring excellence to the embodiment of it in this form, in this medium, who are, who are masters in that craft. Yes. So that we really are going to get something that's additive, um, and for me not to get in the way. I'm just I'm just holding the standard. <laughs> and, You're the and, vessel. <laughs> yeah, and, and being a voice for the readers, like, no, we want we want to see what we we want to see excellence, and we want to see what this looks like in an excellent form in this medium. So that's that's my how I view my role. But I'm okay. excited about that as a developer. Oh, good, good. So uh, I think a lot of people are going to want to see this, you know, this Thank trilogy you. on the big screen. I want to. <laughs> I know, I do too. Um, so what keeps you going when you get stuck? Uh, oh my goodness, what, what a question. That doesn't happen. I feel like you could answer that I'm too. I'm always stuck, yeah. I'm always stuck, I, but I had to rem remember just to, just to let it flow. Like I, I remind myself that my natural state as a creator, as a person, is a flow of creativity. So if I'm stuck, that means that I'm outside. That's not the norm. It's not normal to be stuck. The norm is a flow. So I just try to get unstuck by, um, one of the things is I will try to inspire myself with other people's, I'll read something, watch something, um, listen to something where I'm just wrapping myself in the creativity of, of other people to get back in alignment with my flow. Yes, yes. I do the same thing. I, I read other work um, for yeah. people I really admire. And yeah, that gets yeah. me back into the flow of it. And also sometimes when I write a scene, it's the next day and I'm starting again, I go back and I read. Oh, thank you. And then I got my both versions. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. I go back and, um, you know, read the scene from the night before what I just wrote, you know, yeah. and that, that gets me back into the flow of it too. So yeah. Um, Thanks. That was thanks for that question. Um, what are your favorite and least favorite parts about being an author? My my favorite part, I do actually think is is meeting readers and talking to readers, hearing the different interpretations of <laughs> this thing that I created in isolation. Yes. Um, I I do not love the isolation of writing. I love the imagining of um, characters and stories, but I don't love the isolation of writing. So I always try to place myself in somewhere busy where people are around. So I don't feel like I'm missing out on life huddled <laughs> in the corner somewhere. Uh, so that's kind of my, my least favorite thing is, is the actual isolation of writing. But, um, and my most favorite thing is, is getting to engage with people around the story and, and see how it, um, unfolded in their mind, because that's the other thing you don't know, you know, we have this very imperfect mechanism to transfer what was in our mind into what's yes. in their mind. And we have no idea what really happened on the other end until you tell us. So yeah, yeah. I love that. That's perfect. And that was from Tiana. Thank you for that question. And then Tiffany um, asks, how did being a Detroit native influence you in becoming a writer or in developing the trilogy? 
I am from the D and I, I will say that uh, being from Detroit, it, it actually did influence me in a couple of ways. And one was strangely, I had never been to the Motown Museum until I was like in the like late thirties, but seeing that story of what Barry Gordy did and he learned to go around the obstacles that were imposed upon him by racism and you know, unfortunately how music was segregated and, and the gates were up for the avenues for black artists and black music and how he surmounted that through excellence, diligence, perseverance, and just sheer ingenuity. I, in that museum, I was able to see how he created workarounds just by using his mind and his intelligence around what were created as societal obstacles for him and that were not fair and was unfair. It was based on race alone. It were, there were all these obstacles and through excellence, ingenuity, and perseverance, um, and diligence, he broke through. And I knew that it's possible. And I think there is a grit in Detroit that, um, and maybe it's also kind of Midwestern thing, but I know from being from Detroit, it's just like, we're not going to lose. If you really put a Detroiter in a situation, like we're not going to lose. So I knew that, um, that I, I, this could happen. And I, I felt inspired. And sometimes I just think I'm from Detroit. I can, you know, I can do this. Yeah, yeah I feel like there's a sense <laughs> of pride. There's a sense of pride and swagger that people have from Detroit, just like being from Chicago, South Side, you know? That's right. It's a similar right. kind of vibe that we have. Yeah. 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 We're very proud of where we're from. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so much to be proud of. I mean, there's just so much reflected in the history of those cities and 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 what has been accomplished and and so i'm i'm definitely proud to be from detroit and um thanks for that question of course of course and i'm very proud of everything you have accomplished uh with this tremendous book with this trilogy um very very proud and i'm proud to be in conversation with you and to know you uh as a fellow author i mean it's really nice yeah. to meet somebody else in the trenches who's going through it with me and um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I encourage everybody to go out and buy this book. And um, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. It's such a, it's so great to be in conversation with you. I'm so glad that we're getting to do this. And I know uh, that we're getting to know each other. This is yeah, we get to be on this journey together. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody for attending and really appreciate it. And thanks Morgan and yes, Paul thank you, Pros. Paul Pros, yes. So before we go, um, we'd love to ask our authors uh, what um, they're reading at the moment. So uh, to both you and Nancy, what are you all reading? You want me to start? And then we can yeah, end. you go ahead. You, the star. <laughs> uh, I'm reading two books at once. I'm always seem to have more than one going. So this one, Fiction, Violin, Conspiracy, yeah, by Brendan um, Slocum. It's the Good Morning America pick. And apparently he was here on Politics and Prose featured last night, mm -hmm. uh, Morgan told me. So that's excellent. Um, and it says here, a riveting page turner about a black classical musician's desperate quest to recover his lost violin on the eve of the most prestigious musical competition in the world. And so I think that describes it really well. I'm early in the reading of this one, but uh, really good so far. And then the other one, nonfiction that I'm reading, is the 1619 Project edited by Nicole Hannah-Jones. I feel like this is, should be required reading for everybody. It's really a story of our origins. You know, our origins are not 1776, but 1619, you know, when the first slaves were brought to Jamestown. And so I think it's really a, a great look at um, the contributions that we as black folks have made to the building of this country. Um, and it is true, not just, um, Black history, but American history. Well, I am, I'm, I'm definitely uh, want to read the Violin Conspiracy and the 1619 Project. That's on my list. I'm currently reading Receipt Tatif. Um, they, it was just issued as a standalone book. But why I'm, I was so interested in reading this um, was because uh, I have an unraced character in uh, the Black Girl series. So um, I pe people don't know this maybe, but it's in my little experiment. Uh, Ms. Gretchen is unraced. Like she does not have a race and I'm not, I'm not indicated a race for her. 
I'm, 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 it's a, it's been a, a little bit of a game. Like it's experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely assumptions yeah people make assumptions yeah. but I just I I that was my experiment with her I was like when I was writing her I decided in the first book I'm going to make her unraced and see if anybody notices and then when it comes and I'm like if people ask me and I found in some groups who are like so wait now is Miss Gretchen is she black or is she and they're like if they see her as Betty White they see her as like all different people I mean I was like wow this is so cool like what happens here and it's so it's been my way of kind of seeing if we can get you know if it matters or if it doesn't or so so I was just super this, this book is about it's a short story but it's about two women two young girls and they're both they're one is of one race and one is of a of, one's black one's white but she never says which one and you it's sort of a game you have to play to figure out but there's no way to know like no one's ever figured it out nobody knows but it's a whole story written in this way so it's just it was fascinating to me and then you know thinking about this i was like well i gotta see this um and also uh i'm reading island queen vanessa riley so i love bridgerton bridgerton season two is coming and this is like black caribbean bridgerton <laughs> historical <laughs> fiction with a black female protagonist who's like wealthy and powerful and amazing so i'm like getting ready for bridgerton season two yeah. very good choice love island queen yeah well on the behalf of politics and pearls i'd like to thank you jane for doing this event with us and nancy thank you for being a great moderator um, it was really nice to uh, hear you all talk to each other about writing and um, about Jane's book. And thank you, of course, to our audience for watching and tuning in. Um, please uh, purchase Black Girls Must Be Magic. And the link for The Kindest Lies also in the chat too. Please purchase those books from Politics and Prose. Um, you can also find them in our physical stores as well. And it is your patronage that allows us to bring you all these events. And I hope that everyone has a great Thursday night. All right. Take care, y'all.